Hello, brothers and sisters, and thank you for joining me for the time of Bible teaching. I had a comment that I got today. Somebody's been following me for some time, and it was I, I like this comment. I really do. Something I would have said years ago. Um, I'm going to read it word for word. Our pastor says about Luke 647. So let's look at 647. And this is one you really should have your Bible out for because you you want to be sure what scripture says because when it says our pastor says no offense i don't know your pastor i want to know what scripture says you know if a pastor tells me something i want to see it from scripture but i want to understand context because you can easily take things out of context so let's go to 646 But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things of which I say? Okay, so this is, he says about this verse, that the Ten Commandments are to be obeyed, and that we are to love one another as ourselves. But the statutes, etc., in Leviticus were intended for the Israelites. It's real interesting. I'm going to cut to the chase a little bit here. Where does this comment about, where does it come from Scripture that we are to love others as ourself? Well, let's, uh, I'm just jumping ahead right now. Let's look at Leviticus, the stuff that we're not supposed to look at that's not to the, that's only for the Israelites. Yeah, Leviticus 19.18. Leviticus 19, oops, sorry about that. That's not going to help me. Leviticus 19, 18. You shall not take vengeance nor bear grudge against children, the children of your people. You shall love your neighbors yourself. I am the Lord. So the, the whole thing about you loving the neighbors yourself comes from Leviticus, which this pastor is saying you don't have to listen to. That's only for the Jews. All right, I'm going to jump ahead to something else real quick. We need to understand who Messiah is. I mean, I know you know who he is. Do you? Hmm. Go to 1 John 2. Take the test. See if you really know who he is. We're not going there today. Most people fail that. Fail it miserably and don't care. Yeah, when you get a chance, 1 John 2. There's a test whether or not you know Messiah or you're a liar and the truth is not in you. Most people in a church today would fail that test miserably. I would have years ago. Anyhow, Messiah is the prophet raised up like Moses. Go to Deuteronomy 18. I'm jumping ahead. We're going to come back and look at a lot of things. I'm going to tell you what we're going to look at in a minute. Deuteronomy 18, 15. The, and this is Moses speaking. The Lord, your, the Lord your God will raise up a prophet. Notice the capital P on the prophet. That's because it's Messiah. Like me from the midst of your brethren. Him you shall hear. So he's going to come up from the midst of the children of Israel, the Jews, which he did. According to all you desired of the Lord your God. And Horeb in the day of the assembly saying, let us not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, nor let me see his great fire anymore, lest I die. Remember that. That's important because we're going to come back to that. And the Lord said to me, what I have spoken is good. I will raise up a prophet like you from among their brethren, and I will put my words God's words in his mouth, and he shall speak them to them all that I command him. And it shall be that that who, I'm sorry, that whoever, is that Jew or Gentile? No, it's whoever. And it shall be that whoever will not hear my words, which he speaks in my name, I will require it of him. I've had a person that's in a church that has a prophet leading it, and they're like, no, 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 that's not Messiah. That's the prophet. There's four parts to the Trinity. Is that a quadri? I don't know. Anyhow, see, Messiah confirms that that's who he is in the book of John. John 14. And I think it's, we're just going to go to one verse. I think it's 24. 
And he who does not love me, who does that, or is that you? He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. What words does Messiah have? He doesn't have any. The words that he has are the fathers who sent him. He is the prophet raised up like Moses. All right. I jumped off and I went a little ahead of time. But I think it's funny that this pastor is saying, here's what you listen to. You don't look at Leviticus. But what I'm telling you to look at is from Leviticus, which I'm saying doesn't apply to you. Anyhow, so we're going to look at the Ten Commandments and who are they really for? I mean, is it something we're supposed to listen to or not? Is that it? Um, who was the rest of Torah spoken to? Um, how do the Gentiles fit into all of this? I tell you, Jew and Gentiles, is there really a difference between how we save and get saved and what we're supposed to look at? What about the Sabbath? It's part of the Ten Commandments, but the churches don't follow it. Hmm. And then the rest of the story. All right. That's kind of where I want to go to. And I know this is going to be different than what you were taught. And there's a lot of things that are truth that are different than what we are taught. And I want to start off, in the, as I do with all of the teachings, and I do a lot of teachings about us being taught wrong, and it's based on a scripture in Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. It's before they were carried off to Babylon, and a lot of people died. If they'd listened to Jeremiah, and when Nebuchadnezzar and his armies came, if they would have just gone with him, they would have lived, and eventually come back, or their descendants would have come back into the land. But they didn't. They tried to fight back. They're all wiped out. If you didn't listen to the words of Jeremiah in that day, it did not go well for you. We have a prophecy for Gentiles in the world today. All right? So I want you to go to Jeremiah. Uh, 16, verse 19. O Lord, my strength and my fortress. Hallelujah. My refuge in the day of affliction. Well, this goes into Yom um, Hakaseth, that we are going to be hidden away, that we're going to, in, in the day of affliction, the day of tribulation. This, and during tribulation, this word affliction is the same word that he, Jeremiah uses in chapter 30, about the time of Jacob's troubles. That word troubles and affliction are the same words in Hebrew. We're going to be hidden away during that time in the Father's house. But it says on this judgment day, the Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, surely our fathers have inherited lies. Worthlessness and unprofitable things. Worthlessness. Fathers, there is no word, biblical word in Hebrew for grandfather or great-grandfather. That's why you see our father David, your father Abraham, even though there's a thousand, two thousand years or more in between. How much do you think this worthlessness and unprofitable things is going to benefit these Gentiles in the day of affliction, in the day that we're living in, because we all believe that the rapture is just around the corner. Well, it can't be until Rosh Hashanah, but anyhow, other people believe something different, but we believe it's close, it's soon. How much is this worthlessness and unprofitable things going to help people? It's not. This should be freaking out people. People should be, like, worried about this. Am I the one that was taught worthlessness and unprofitable things? Keep in mind. There's only a little stairway to heaven and few people get to it. Matthew 5, and there's a highway to hell. All right, I know it's a wide road and a narrow road. I like the highway to heaven and the stairway to hell. Excuse me, stairway to heaven and a highway to hell. And it's basically saying the same thing. And it tells you right then and there, go to Matthew 5 or Matthew 7. And I'm getting off track to start with, but that's okay. Here we go, the narrow gate, your highway to, your stairway to heaven, and um, the wide is the road that leads to destruction, your highway to hell. Beware of false prophets, Matthew written in Hebrew, prophets includes teachers. He's telling you the problem is the teachers. We're going to be taught wrong, and that's what's happening. Okay, so we're going to be looking at, I went through the list of what we're looking at, so let's get into this.
What did Messiah say the most important thing was that we should be listening to? What is the most important things out of Torah, out of the commandments that we are to listen to? You know that before we do this, I have to say something else. There are people who, who want to pick and choose what words of Messiah we will listen to. There are people who believe that Messiah only spoke to the Jews and that Paul spoke to the Gentiles. And they pick and choose what books of the Bible that apply to them. This one blows me away. And there's one question I'll ask them that they can't answer. What's that? Um, as a Christian, as a follower of Christ, if Messiah, Hamashiach, Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, which words of his are we not to listen to? Which words of his are we to disregard? None. Do Jews and Gentiles get saved different ways? Hmm. Go to, I know I'm jumping around. Go to, and it is putting bugs in your ear. Go to John 14, 6, real quick. John 14, 6. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, you've heard this. No one comes to the Father except through me. Is this for Jews or Gentiles? Keep in mind, there are no Gentile believers at this time. Now, the, the answer is yes. No one. Does that include Jews or Gentiles? No one comes to the Father except through Messiah. We all need Messiah. There is. I always believe there was a Jewish way and a Christian way. No, there's Messiah's way. All right, let's get into this. All right. Um, so what did Messiah say was the most important thing? And you guys know, but let's see it from Scripture. Let's go to... Eh. Here we go. Sorry about that. Um, let's go to Mark 12. Verses 28. 28 through 34. And that's not right, is it? Oh, no, I'm in Matthew. Duh. Mark 12, 28 through 34. Okay, let's try this again. Mark 12, 28 through 34. And one of the scribes, what's a scribe? The scribe were the, the people that were writing out the Torah over and over. They would write the scrolls. But because they did that, they were the ones that were the experts in the law. They were the lawyers, you could say. So they traveled along with the, the um, Pharisees, and they were the experts. They were known as the wise men. You know the wise men that came to see Messiah? Well, the greater Yeshua teaching school was where at this time? Babylon. Most of the Jews never came back. Yeah. So the, the wise men that came were scribes, Jews. Anyhow, one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceived that he had answered them well. Asked him, which, of the, which is the first commandment of all? In other words, which is the greatest commandment? Jesus answered them. This, um, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment, the greatest commandment. And the second one, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And we know that this second one here is from Leviticus 19 which this pastor is saying, you don't look at Leviticus, then why are you looking at this? The, uh, most of the New Testament is taken right out of the Old Testament. People don't know that. But if a teacher like Messiah mentions these two things that are out of the Old Testament, he's telling you, go back and look at these. Examine them so you really understand what he's saying. 
We don't do that. We don't know that. We're not taught to look at Scripture that way. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth. For there is one God, and there is no one other, uh, there is, and there is no one other but he. And to love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than the whole of the burnt offerings and sacrifices. It's, that's more important than the rest of everything. That's the most important. And we're going to see that in a minute. Now, when Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared to question him. Why? We well, have to understand what time of the, of the life of Messiah that th this is going on. Messiah has already had his triumphal entry on what we know as Palm Sunday. And there are four days in which the Lamb, Messiah, our Passover Lamb, was taken into the house before it was crucified to be examined to make sure that there were no flaws, no blemishes. And they didn't find any on him. And that's why no one dared to ask him another question. They couldn't find any blemishes on him. So we're just a couple days before he gets crucified. Messiah could have said, hey, I tell you what, guys, I'm about to get crucified. All of this law and prophet stuff is going to go out the window. Don't have to do it anymore. It's going away because I have fulfilled it. I know I'm being a little silly here. He didn't say that. See, Matthew adds a little more to this story, a little, another little wrinkle here as to what Messiah said. And a lot of times when you have parallel passages, you have to look at the parallel passages to get the whole story. So let's get another little tidbit here out of Matthew. Um, we want to go to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. What verse? So 36 through 40. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? He goes through all this. But at the end, he says, on these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. So are they done away with? Are they like hung like and dead? No, that's not it. These are the two most important. Everything else falls underneath of it. In other words, if you loving God with everything you got and loving your others as yourself, you will pretty much automatically do all of the rest. They come underneath. These are the most important. You'll notice that which of the Ten Commandments are these? They're not in the Ten Commandments. We already showed that the one is from Leviticus, which this pastor is saying, you don't look at Leviticus, that's for the Jews, that's not for you. Where is the commandment about loving God with everything you got? It's Deuteronomy 6. And by the way, all you'd have to do is look. See this where it has a footnote? Footnote. Go down here. See, it's Leviticus 19.18, Deuteronomy 6.5. Let's start up here. Hear, O Lord. Hear, O Israel. This is to Israel. But this teacher is saying that, that this is like only to God, the Gentiles. They're picking and choosing which one goes to the, the Jews and which one to the Gentiles. By the way, Leviticus 19 was to the Gentiles as, or to Jews as well. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our, the, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These are the words I command you today. Um, that shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently. This is all of Torah. If you read this in context, this is all of Torah that he's talking about. That you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. In other words, all day long, the words of God should be on your mind. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and between your front lobes, hand, forehead. Later on, there's going to, during the Great Tribulation, there's going to be a guy 
The Antichrist, who's going to be indwelled by Satan, who's known as the man of lawlessness. The definition of lawlessness is the condition of being without Torah, law, God's commandments, by choice or ignorance. And he's going to want you to put his mark where God told you to bind Torah. You should write them on your doorposts of your house and your gates. All right. How does this work together? All right. Who was Israel? Let's go real quick to Leviticus 19.8. If you don't get who's being talked to here, 19. Speak to the congregation of Israel, the children of Israel, the children of Israel. And when you look through the Torah and throughout Leviticus as to who things are being given to, it's to the children of Israel. Okay. Um, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, it was a mixed multitude. Exodus 12. 36 and 37. Twelve brothers in it is Egypt. Um, it's 37, 38. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkot. That's not a sukkah. That's actually a city. About 600,000 men on foot besides children. And there's no mention of women. So this is 600,000 plus women and children. A mixed multitude went up with them, with flocks and herds and a great deal of livestock. This is a lot of people, but this is a mixed multitude. There are lots of people in Egypt, and there's a lot of people that said, oh my goodness, I know, I know the Egypts had a, had a uh, their God had a snake, but the snake of Moses' God, he was bigger, badder, and hungrier. I'm following that God. So it's a mixed multitude. And you see all these things about the children of Israel. Let me ask you this. Where will Messiah be in the millennial kingdom? Go to Ezekiel. Forty-three. So afterwards he brought me to the gate facing the east, and behold, the glory of God of Israel. What's the glory of God of Israel? No, it's who? That's Messiah. Came from the way of the east. Let's go down a little further real quick. Uh, and the glory of God of, of the Lord came into the temple by the way of the gate, which faces to the east. That's Messiah coming into the millennial kingdom, into the throne of David, the, sitting on the throne of David. And he said to me, son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet. That shows ownership. Where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. Paul told us that we are going to forever be with the Lord. If we're not part of the children of Israel, we are not part. We're not with Messiah in the millennial kingdom because he's going to be in the midst of the children of Israel. We have to be part of the children of Israel to have a part of Messiah. Bottom line. How do we get that? We are grafted in. Just like all of those people from all the other countries that came out of Egypt with the Jews were grafted in. We can read how Paul talks about us being the wild branch that's grafted into Israel, into the olive tree. How do I know? That's Abraham. Abraham was saved by faith. We know that. Throughout the New Testament, did you know that he kept the commandments? Give me a minute. Oh. For this. Hold on. It's in Genesis 26, verse 5. These were words that were spoken to um, Isaac. I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give your descendants 
all these lands um, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my Torah, my law. Abraham came to faith, then began following Torah before Moses ever put it in writing. It has always existed. Um, all right. Yeah. The Ten Commandments. What about the Sabbath? I was always taught, well, the Sabbath was moved. Really? Why? Because something amazing happened that changed the whole world. Messiah was crucified on the Sabbath, and it was just amazing. And it's like it changed human history forever. So the Sabbath was moved. Really? I was taught that. Is that what Scripture teaches? What day was Messiah crucified on? Good Friday? Well, if it's a Friday, then he's a false prophet because you're not going to get from Friday to Sunday and have three days and three nights. Another story. He's crucified on Passover. That's not actually not where I wanted to go. Sorry. What day did he arise? That's Ishtar. And if you look at how the church calculates Easter, it's based on what Constantine gave us many years many years ago, and it's not in Scripture. Scripture teaches that he was he arose on the feast of first fruits, and he's the first fruits of the resurrection to life. And he was crucified not on uh, he was crucified on Passover, okay? Because he is the Passover lamb. So let's do a quick look in Leviticus 23. And in Leviticus 23, you have the building blocks to everything from Scripture. I guess this is part of what that pastor said we're not supposed to obey. This is for the Jews, not for the church. Who is this to? Speak to the children of Israel. Yeah, the Sabbath, Passover, where Messiah is crucified. The Feast of First Fruits, where Messiah arose. In here, you also have unleavened bread, where Messiah was in the grave. You also have Shabuot. This here is called the Feast of Weeks, when the Holy Spirit came down. These are appointed times. Are they Jewish? Hmm. Let's read here. Speak to the children of Israel. Say to them, these are the feasts of the Lord. The church calls them Jewish. The Lord calls them His. If this, being to the children of Israel, has nothing to do with the church, then the death, burial, and resurrection of Messiah has nothing to do with the church. Flat out. This was given to them. And Messiah was the Passover lamb, crucified on Passover. His body was in the grave during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And he's also the first fruits of the resurrection of life. Did something miraculous happen that God didn't foresee that he was going to arise on a Sunday to change everything? He shall wave the sheath before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So Messiah arose on the day after the Sabbath. Does the church keep the Sabbath? They moved it to Sunday. Maybe something happened. I remember I was in this church once and they're talking about the new covenant. Oh my goodness, good thing God came up with a new covenant. That old covenant, all these animals were dying. There was blood everywhere. It was so bad. Good thing God came up with a new covenant. Like, did something happen and God's up in heaven going, Oy vey, what am I to do now? Look at the blood. How am I going to get the, the, the uh, bl blood out of all of those, that marble and that, the stones down there? And my poor animals. Did God have to come up with a plan B? <laughs> no, of course not. Go, go to Psalm 89. Actually, I think it's Proverbs 89, but go to Psalm 89 in case I'm wrong. No, it has to be Psalm. My bad. Psalm 89. 
verse 34. This is the words of our Lord, our, of God. 34, did I say? My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Does God change? No, he's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He doesn't need a plan B because he has seen the end, end from the beginning. He knows everything. Doesn't need a plan B. Okay. Give me a second. But but the early church, the early church worship on the first day of the week, they changed the Sabbath. It's in Scripture. I was taught that. It looks like it says that. And you're looking at Acts 20, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. Let's look at what it actually says, okay? So let's go to, and this is something that if, if, if you believe in a conspiracy theories are possible, here's one for you. Somebody changed this. Somebody changed it to make it look like they changed the Sabbath. I believe it. But you, know, you be the judge. And it says very clearly, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Talk about a long sermon. Teaching till midnight? Well, that's a bad word. Let's look at that real quick. That word's wrong. And see, you can't always trust all the words. you got to know... Sometimes words are, like, translated wrong. It says midnight. Um, result of these two words. Among, it's midst, among, from among. Middle, the midst, the midst of. This is between two days. That's evening twilight. That's with, but in when when the King James Bible was written, the between two days was midnight. It's just like, was Jesus a carpenter, or his dad Joseph was he a carpenter? There are no trees in Israel. They made everything out of stone. He wasn't a carpenter. The word is builder. Anyhow, let's get a little, go and look a little more at this this phrase. Um, and what did it say exactly? Now on the first day of the week. You see that day there that's italicized? That means it's not there. They added that in to make the reading a little easier. And upon the first, no day, of the week. What's that word? Sabaton. Sabbath? Yep. The seventh day of every week, the sacred day, the single Sabbath, the Sabbath day. <laughs> okay. So the first, where is this word first? See that word they say it's first right there? Let's look at it. It is not first. It is one. This actually reads on one of the Sabbaths. Let's go back and give another look here. It does. It reads on one of the Sabbaths. What's going on here? Let's look. Let's read it appropriately. Now, on one of the Sabbaths, um, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued the message until evening twilight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. But let's look at the verse before this. Before we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. Okay, what happens after unleavened bread? Unleavened bread is the day after Passover, and it's for eight days. Then what do you do? You count seven Sabbaths till you get to the 50th day of Pentecost. You get it? on one of the Sabbaths. It's on one of those days. Yet, pastor after pastor will teach. See? No, they changed it. All right. I have a teaching I did not long ago, and I will attach it to this to, in the comments here about what the Roman Catholic Church has to say about Sabbaths. They will tell you that 
If you are following scripture, you should observe Saturday as the Sabbath. That it was Rome that changed it, and by observing Sunday as the Sabbath, you are showing your allegiance to Rome and not to God. And it's not me saying it. It's the Roman Catholic Church. And I have quote after quote. I probably went through 20 of them. I've got hundreds of these quotes through different Roman periodicals, statements made, etc., etc., etc. And I'm going to attach a copy of that video to, or an attachment to that video here. This stuff's important. Why? What did Paul, what did Paul say? Go to Romans 6. Romans 6. I think it's 16. Do you not know that whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey? whether sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So if Scripture tells you to obey the Sabbath and Rome tells you to move it to Sunday, who are you being a slave to? And slave is the same word as servant. We are servants to Messiah. We are to obey him. Are we obeying Messiah or are we obeying Rome? Um, what does God say about Sabbath? Go to Exodus 31. Again, more to the story is coming up, and I want to explain more about how the Ten Commandments and Torah are linked together. But go to Exodus 31, 13. Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep. Remember, if you're not part of the children of Israel, you're not in the millennial kingdom with Messiah. He will reign in the midst of the children of Israel forever. It is a sign between you, between me and you, throughout your generations, forever, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. It's a sign. It's like a wedding ring that you would put on your finger saying who you belong to. He's serious about a Sabbath, not just a weekly Sabbath, but you have other Sabbaths. The most, many of the appointed times are Sabbaths. All right. But, but Paul, <laughs> we're going to look at a little bit of a couple things that Paul said. And then the question is now, you've got to be asking yourself, what are we really supposed to listen to? What words as Christians are we supposed to listen to? It's really easy. Messiah made it real clear. Okay. But let's just look at a couple things that Paul told us. Let's go to Acts. Twenty-four. Fourteen. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, in the early church was called the way, which they call a sect. What does it mean, a sect? Well, it was a sect of Judaism. There was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, um, the other guys. Um, I can't think of the name of it. But they were sects. The way was a sect, a branch of Judaism at that time. So I worship the God of my fathers, believing all the things which are written in the law and the prophets. What did Paul believe that was in the law and prophets? Everything. Everything. Paul didn't want to get rid of or saying anything's done away with, or whatever. He believed all of it. And this is near his, this is like close to his deathbed. Um, go to 1 Corinthians 7. You won't find most pastors teaching on something like this. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 19. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. Jew and Gentile is nothing. Is nothing. It doesn't matter. But keeping the commandments of God is what matters. That's what's important, keeping the commandments of God. Those were Paul's words. So what did Messiah tell us? What words should we keep? 
go to G Matthew 4, and he's having a little conversation with Satan out in the wilderness during Teshuva. Um, and he says to them, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. But again, Messiah is the prophet raised up like Moses. He doesn't have his own words. He only speaks the words that the Father gives him. Notice a little footmark here. Deuteronomy 8, 3. And most of the times you don't have footmarks. We need to know these things. Why aren't you just like going when I click there? Eh, it should go that. But anyhow, let's just go to Deuteronomy 8, 3 and just confirm this is what it says. Actually, it's going to give us a lot more. Because when, when uh, for example, I'm just going to throw something out to you. Go back to your homework. Check this out. Messiah's up on the cross being crucified. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I've taught over and over that that means that God forsook uh, Messiah, that, um, what was I going to say? Why am I number, or Deuteronomy 3, good. That it should be eight. Anyhow, God forsook Messiah because he couldn't go to hell and all of this stuff because he was going to go to hell and set the captives free, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it couldn't happen. So God left Messiah at that point. And that, like, negates the fact that Messiah was God. Well, for that moment, no, 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 no. There's something else at play. When he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22. And this is throughout the words of Messiah. He's talking from Psalm, from Isaiah, from Torah. But we don't get it because we're not taught it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's right there in Psalm 22. So what Messiah is saying is, hey guys, I know I'm up on the cross. I'm being crucified. Don't freak out. Go back and see what David wrote a thousand years ago. Um, my, for the dogs that surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has in, in, enclosed me. They pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. Why? The cat and nine tails ripped off all the flesh off of him. This is the vivid description of his crucifixion. At his crucifixion, he's saying, hey guys, go back and read what David wrote about this. So go to Deuteronomy 8, verses 1 through 3. Every commandment which I command you today, must you must be careful to observe. And this is all of Torah. That you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord your swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years into the wilderness to test humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you and allowed you to hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. That's every word. That's all of Torah. All right, more to the story. Let's go to, I know most people won't make it there, and that's a shame. But that's okay. Some people will, and this is for them. Exodus 19. And I want to show you something that's pretty cool. This is when Torah was given, when the Ten Commandments were given. Um, the day, in the third month, the children, if you count the days out, this is Shavuot. Okay? What the church calls Pentecost, but the church counts Pentecost from Easter, which was screwed up because that's Ishtar. And they, they did it like the Paschal moon after this or that, which is not in Scripture. Oh, my goodness. This is Shavuot. This is when the Holy Spirit came down with um, Peter. This is when Israel was betrothed to God. The betrothal, which when we come to Messiah and we're given the deposit, the Holy Spirit, that's our betrothal. 
And guess when the wedding day is? Rosh Hashanah. That's when he comes back to get us. That's what this teaches. When you understand these days. It's kind of cool. Um, go to verse 16. I can't go through all of this. It came to pass on the third day. <laughs> I love those third days. In the morning, there was thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountains. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud. And that all the people were... Um, and the camp trembled. You'll see elsewhere in here that the trumpet got louder and louder and louder right here. This is the first trumpet. It is akin to the last trumpet that gets louder and louder and louder. See the word thunderings? What is that word thundering? We just think thunderings. More than that. I mean, I'm not, I hit the wrong word, didn't I? Thunders. Voices. Voice, but it's quote, it's voices. This is where God spoke audibly to them in voices. In other words, everybody heard it in their own language, just like when Peter spoke. What do you speak to them? Go to chapter 20. 18. All right, let's read from here. Um, now, the, all the people witnessed the thunderings, the voices. They heard God speak. The lightnings. And actually, what they spoke was right here. This is what God spoke, the Ten Commandments. Okay? All the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightnings, flashes, the sound of the trumpet, that first trumpet, the mountain smoking. And the people saw it, and they trembled and stood off afar. They had to do a lot of laundry. Yeah, you can guess why. Then they spoke to Moses. You shall speak with us, and we will hear you. But, not, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, Do not, be, do not fear. For God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood off afar, and Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. In other words, they're saying, let God tell Moses the rest, and we will do what you say. And guess what? That's the rest of Torah um, that was accepted. And that's for Jews and Gentiles. It's for the children of Israel. And if you're not part of that children of Israel, you are not going to be with Messiah in the millennial kingdom. That's where he's going to reign in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And this goes right back to where we started, or one of the places we were at earlier, Deuteronomy 18. And the Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me, Messiah, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. According to all that you desired of the Lord and of your God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let us not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, but tell Moses. He'll tell us, and we will do it. A mixed multitude. They, the the non-Jews were grafted in. Nor let me see his great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, What they have spoken is good. I will raise up a prophet like you from among your brethren, and put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak them that all that I have commanded him. Yet people say that Messiah spoke a new commandment. He did everything new. Messiah changed everything. They don't understand scripture. They don't even understand who Messiah is. And again, take the test. Do you know him? Go to 1 John 2. And if you fail that test, you have some issues, possibly. Or John is just a false prophet and rip everything John wrote out of the Bible, throw it away, burn it, whatever. It's false teacher, whatever. Um, again, 
I want to close with a verse that I like. I wish I I don't have all these verses memorized myself. But back to John 10, this is where Messiah said that he only speaks the words the Father gave him. Or that's John 14, my apologies. Anyhow, and the Father knows me. Even so, I know my Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And Messiah did that. He laid down his life for you and me. And other sheep I have, which are not in this fold, them I must, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore, my father loves me because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. But let me ask you this real quick here. How many Gentiles are saved at this point? None. What sheep are in the fold at this point? The disciples, Jews, the first Gentile believer was the centurion with Peter. That's the first Gentile to come to Messiah and to receive the Holy Spirit. At Acts, in Acts, when the on on Shavuot, it was it was only Jews that were there when the Holy Spirit fell down. That fold is Jewish. We are the other sheep which he must bring into the fold because there is one flock and one shepherd. There is not a Jewish way and a Gentile way. There is Messiah's way, and that's it. You guys have a great day. Thank you.